my first question is, where did you get the passion for uh, music? How did you start? <laughs> um, well, I guess since I was a, a very little kid, I loved music. Um, I, I was never formally trained, but we had a piano in the house, and so I would, I would pick out tunes uh, by ear. And when I was, I guess, 13 years old, I or 14 years old, I was cast in a nationwide McDonald's commercial. It, it, it aired all over America. And because of that, I made a little bit of money, and I was able to buy my first synthesizers and drum machines. So I spent all of high school writing pop music, and uh, still all by ear, I didn't read music, but it's just what I, I love doing more than anything. And then when I went to college, I joined the choir, and that was it. Then I was, I was hooked forever. Okay, so then you were actually educated in music afterwards. Yeah. <clears throat> That's right. Although I have to say I'm still... Yeah, I have a master's degree now too, but I, I still struggle with, with written music. Uh, it, it's, it doesn't come completely naturally to me still. I, I, I still feel it and hear it by ear first, and then I have to sit down and force myself to write it down. That's brilliant. And uh, another question that I am dying to ask you is, how did you get the idea for the virtual choir? So, it was this, well, you saw the TED video, but I'll explain it anyway. So, th this, this young woman named Brittlin Losi sent me a fan video. She posted it to YouTube, and she was singing the soprano line to a piece of mine called Sleep. And it was just so tender and innocent and beautiful. And I had this idea immediately when I saw it, if I could somehow get 50 people all to sing at the same tempo, and we started all their videos at the same time, and they all sang in the right key, it, it, would, it would have to make a choir, right? It would, it would work. So, so that was just the idea, and then everything blossomed from there. Um, one question that I often get, when uh, I show that video around, is how did they actually do it? I mean, technically. How do you manage to synchronize perfectly and, uh, you know, make it, make it sound well at the end? It's a lot of work. Um, the, there's two parts to it. There's, the, there's the, the audio and the visual, of course. The visual, in some ways, is easier um, in that once you get everybody started at the same time, then, then the videos tend to line up correctly. But the audio, of course, needs all kinds of cleaning. You can imagine some, some audio tracks, they, they've got, you can hear computer noise, fan noise. You can hear sirens from ambulances outside. You can hear crickets. In one video, we could hear somebody's mother yelling at them in the background. <laughs> and, and so all of this, you have to take track by track and clean them. You have to scrub them so, so that only the audio exists. So that takes quite a while. And then, then there's some alignment when it comes to uh, consonants, especially at the ends and begin, beginnings of words. Sleep, for instance, is, was a really tough one because of all of the S's. And so sometimes you'll hear sleep. But we tried to keep that as honest as possible so that if some people came a little bit early, then... You just had an elongated S. Okay, so how long did it take to make both a sleep and looks a room quay? Looks a room quay, ironically, they took about the same amount of time, even though sleep has more than 10 times more videos in it. But looks a room quay was entirely done, audio and video, by a single person, uh, by Scott Haynes. This 22-year-old uh, man in, in America who took the entire job on himself and I think worked night and day for three months to make that happen. Then with sleep, we had a whole team of people doing it. Uh, several audio engineers and, and, a, a, and, and we separated them. So there was a, a video team and an audio team. How did you get to speak, for example, at the TED? It was the most amazing thing. So... Uh, you know, I had for years watched the TED videos online, like a lot of people, and just marveled and sat in awe of these people. Um, and then one day on, on Facebook, I received a message from Chris Anderson, who is the head and the curator of TED, saying, 
I just love what you've done. Would you be interested in presenting at TED next year? And I, you know, I fell out of my chair. I couldn't believe that he was asking me this. So I wrote back and said, yes, my God, of course, I'd, I'd love to. And then I, I wasn't prepared, though. He, he put me on the, the very first, uh, I was one of the first speakers in, in the morning, the, 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 one of the first four speakers. And that, it was just a huge honor and a, and a real thrill to be there. So um, one other question I'd like to ask you is, um, since you've done, you've practically managed to do uh, a virtual choir crowdsourced on the internet, basically that's what it is, do you think yeah. it would be possible to crowdsource other artistic uh, works? Absolutely. Um, I'm surprised, first of all, that nobody has done dance which to me seems so obvious. They, they've certainly done all kinds of flash mob dances, which are interesting, you know, where suddenly thousands of people show up and do Michael Jackson's Thriller or, or something. Uh, but I'm amazed that someone hasn't had the idea yet to, to have individuals dancing wherever they are, be choreographed, and then cut them all together the same way that we do the virtual choir, and then make, you can actually make pictures. You know, you know if, for, for instance, I've imagined that if you, if you told everybody, all right, let's say, for instance, there was a single gesture, you're lifting your arm or something, and then you said to people, all right, if you were born in January, then you're going to, every time you lift your arm, it goes to one, or if you were born in December, every time you lift your arm, it goes to 12, right? So that, like, on a clock. And then you could take, if you had thousands of these videos, you could actually paint pictures with, with the choreography. So... Uh, I, I really think it's limitless. Uh, I should say it's not that people haven't had the idea. Probably people have had that idea. It's, it's more people might not have the time or the resources because it takes forever to make these things happen. So, um, but yeah, I think we're just starting to scratch the surface of what's possible. Yeah, I know it's um, for, for you know, videos, for example, uh, YouTube did a great job with uh, Life in a Day. So um, I was wondering... Would you do that kind of uh, kind of project with the with the dance videos? Yeah, you know it's it's funny. Even for this virtual choir, which we're not going to do, I had I had one of the things I pitched was doing dance and singing at the same time. So so making a, a call to dancers and singers and asking them to do specific things, then cutting it all together to create this thing. Uh, ultimately, it, like I said, it becomes a question of resources. And we just didn't have the resources to pull it off this time. But absolutely, I'd love to do that. I love the the Life in the Day uh, movie. It's it's beautiful and brilliant. Um. So yeah, I, I I I would love to I'd love to try all of this. For for me, I talk about resources. It's all about just hours in a day, you know, and <laughs> um, because. Uh, you know, with, with everything else that I'm doing, so somewhere I'm I'm supposed to be composing. That's apparently that's my first job, and so <laughs> I'm always trying to leave just enough time to actually write new music. So what what is your what is the piece of classical music that or the composer that most inspires you? God, um, uh, I mean it's endless, really, but. Uh, two that I always that I always go back to for inspiration. One is the is Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. Um, first, I just as a composer, I sort of stand in awe at its mastery. I can't believe that a human being could write this, and then could write it completely deaf. Can you imagine that? That he that not only could he hear all of it in his head and, and construct it, but that he did. Why would you? Why would you make something if you could never hear it? It's, I mean, it's it's it's. He's driven by this passion. It, it's more than passion. It's um. It's I I don't know what it is. It's, and it was incredibly generous, actually. Yeah, yeah, it truly was. I think that's a beautiful way to say it. And yeah, in in the face of this affliction, and by all accounts, Beethoven was not a um, <laughs> was not a friendly person. Uh, he he wrote about joy and about brotherhood, and so so. Uh, 
my my yeah that that's that's a huge source of inspiration for me. The other piece is equally well known. It's the Rite of Spring, uh, the Sacre du Printemps by uh, Stravinsky, and you know Stravinsky wrote it when he was thirty one, and he, he used the orchestra in a way that I don't think had ever been used before and has never been used since. And that, that he could somehow conceive that an orchestra could do this. Because when, when you play it on the piano, the, the piece, it doesn't work. Well, it kind of works, but it doesn't sound at all like the, the orchestral piece. It's such a vision. Um, so, so as a composer as well, I stand. Well, it, so those pieces, and then I should say anything written by Bach. <laughs> okay, yeah, I, I kind of... I kind of heard that kind of uh, of inspiration in your um, in in looks are wrong with sounds kind of you know coming from that direction in some way from Bach's music I mean. Thank you. That's a huge compliment. <laughs> so uh, at this point we are done with the classical composers. So I want to ask you, who do you like among the contemporary ones? Uh, contemporary, but concert composers, you mean? Like playing uh, orchestral music and... Yeah, yeah. Uh, I love John Adams. Uh, he's an American composer. Uh, Arvo Pert, an Estonian composer. Um, who have I been listening to recently? You know, I just heard a piece by a Norwegian composer named Anders Hilborg. Actually, my wife, Hila, sang it in Los Angeles with the Los Angeles Philharmonic. Uh, that was pretty stunning. I didn't know his work at all. It was for chorus and orchestra and, and two soloists. That, that was pretty thrilling. Um, I don't know, can, can you call... Is, is Ligeti contemporary? Probably not, huh? I don't know. <laughs> Isn't that funny? It, it, it makes me laugh, too, like with something like the Rite of Spring that it's a hundred years old now. It still feels so fresh and new. Um, listen, now I am very curious to ask you another thing. Have you ever worked with your wife? It, it, all the time. <laughs> she's a very famous uh, soprano, right? Yeah, yeah, she's incredible. She's the real musician in the family. <laughs> Where do you find all that music? Where do you listen? Where do you, where do you, where, what's your source, you know, where you find all that fabulous music you have, you, you listen to? Oh, you mean just, just where do I find music to listen to? Yeah. God, uh, well, it's, I guess, two places now. It's either from friends suggesting things that I should listen to or just online. I mean, it's, it's unbelievable. You spend two hours on YouTube just bouncing from track to track. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's, and, and you can find your way from, you know, you could be, you can go from Lincoln Park to, to Ligeti in, in eight moves. And, and there's, there's just so much stuff. Also now, an interesting thing has happened, maybe you've seen this, but on my Facebook page, um, people are sharing things with me. Uh, I'll, yeah. I put up things that I like, and then people all the time put up things that I like. And just this morning, I'm looking at it right now, somebody posted Devin Townsend. Who, who I didn't really know. I, I knew he was a metal guy, uh, but this thing that they posted was beautiful, so I went and bought it, and, and now I'm kind of a fan. So, um, from this point of view, uh, do you think that some modern tools, such as the uh, iTunes Genius, could actually help uh, and be you know, the, the kind of source you can use to, to get new stuff? Or it's more useful to use uh, a social approach? Hmm, that's interesting. Um, yeah, so so th the best I've seen it so far is with Netflix. So, so Netflix, of course, is very popular in the United States, and and they have a very very successful algorithm for determining what you might like based on your previous choices. And so many times I would go and it would say, "We recommend this for you," and I was pretty amazed at the recommendations. I thought, yeah, actually, that's, yeah, that's what I would like. Um, and then that was only based on, on things that I had, had, had liked or had watched. I imagine that that kind of thing is going to get more and more refined. 
the, the trick is, the trick is with that, something like, for instance, even with this Devin Townsend thing, I don't think any algorithm would ever recommend that to me. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So I, maybe they will. I, I don't know. But th this person, uh, Shay Hendren, said, uh, you know, I thought you might like this. And, you know, who knows why he thought I would like it. It could be completely random. But uh, I, I have a feeling that, that there are... The, the problem with the, with the algorithms is that they're going to give you what you like. And maybe that's not what you need. Um, this whole project, the virtual choir project, first with uh, Luxembourg and then with the Sleep, it actually brought that feeling of uh, brotherhood, uh, you know, from people from all over the world actually sending music, you know, and, and music is known to be something that bonds, uh, bonds people more than anything else. And um, so I, I'd like to ask you, what did you talk about at the UN Leaders Program? <laughs> in the light of this of this consideration. This was the funniest thing ever. So what I understood I was going to be speaking about was just the virtual choir and how I did it and and what it meant to me. So I gave, I don't know, a 20-minute presentation. And then there was another half an hour open for questions from the delegates. <laughs> and suddenly, people, these UN delegates were asking me, Given what you've done, uh, how can this be applied toward bringing peace, for instance, to the Middle East or to... I, I couldn't believe they were asking me these questions. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, I, I told them that, um, you, you know, people need to feel that they're part of something greater than themselves. This is the key. Uh, and when they do... Uh, Human beings are—they're just—they're capable of more than than we could ever dream, and especially together. And with a unified, shared vision, people just stop fighting. It's my feeling. I mean, um, it's easy to say. I, I also told them because they were asking a lot about as a conductor, how is it that I bring about, uh, you know, a sense of unity and peace? And I was saying, well, it's 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 a tricky analogy because as a conductor you're kind of a dictator <laughs> <You know? laughs> it's, well it's not a democracy at all within an orchestra or a chorus um, it's uh, it, it, you, you're, you're trying to lead the people but but at the end of the day everyone has to answer to the person on the podium um, so so it, it was just a very funny and and sweet conversation I was I was hugely honored to be speaking to them so, um, what does it mean for you, the virtual choir? Uh, well, like I said in the TED Talk, it, I, I feel that people will go to any lengths necessary to find and connect with each other. And they will use whatever technology is available to them. It could be a scroll, it could be uh, a telegraph, it could be the internet, it, it really doesn't matter. I, like I said before, I, I believe that people want and need to be part of something greater than themselves. There's a, a philosopher named Ernest Becker who wrote about, uh, wrote a book called The Denial of Death. And he believed that the human civilization, aware of its own mortality, longs to be greater longs to be part of something greater than itself. He, he called it um, an immortality project. That it was a way of making, of living beyond your physical body, if, if you could, could be part of something. And I definitely know that I aspire to that, and I think I see that in other people as well. And, and not to get too lofty or, or too poetic with it, but somehow I think the virtual choir uh, it, it makes a, a very simple and poetic symbol of that idea. You know, you can see everyone's faces. They're all singing together. They've come from all over the world. God knows why. Um, and they're singing. What, what could be better than people singing together?
That's beautiful. And um, my last question is one question that I like to ask my interviewees. And uh, they often tell me it's the most difficult, but anyway, I'm going to give it a try. So what is the question that you never get, but, but you think is really, really relevant at this point? Oh my God, about anything? About, well, about music, especially. That's a good question. Um, well, it's, it's funny, I, I, I don't think I, I'm not sure I have an answer for it, but the, the question I, I never really get asked is, why is my music becoming popular? <laughs> why do I think it's becoming popular? I never get asked that question. Um, and like I say, I'm not entirely sure I have an answer. Uh, I'd like to think that it's because um, because it's um, it's it's reflecting or tapping into something that's essentially human. Um, but more and more, I'm thinking that. The, the music and, and all great music is doing something physiological that, that, that there's more there's more than just the, the poetry of it that in fact that there is something with the vibrations themselves that physically affect people I, I don't know what that is or how it works but I do know that when I'm composing I'm searching all the time for for, for moments or arcs that give me chills, that, that give me butterflies, that make my body feel a certain way, or that make my throat ache. And when I feel them, usually then other people feel them in the music. It's the strangest, strangest phenomenon. I don't understand it at all. So what do you prefer to compose? What kind of music do you mostly prefer to compose? Well, I guess I'm most comfortable with, with composing choral music now, with music for choirs. But recently I've been composing a lot for strings, and I love, love, love writing for strings. I love writing for my wife. She's got, you know, you've heard, she's got this exquisite instrument. Um, if, if I could do anything, if, if I just had my choices right now, I, could, I would probably compose some sort of pop rock album and, and collaborate with... Radiohead and Imogene Heap and Peter Gabriel and and do some weird hybrid of the things I do and the things they do and um, <laughs> yeah. Eric, I thank you so much for your time and for being with us today. It was really a great, great honor and pleasure to have you. No, no, thank you, Maria. I'm truly honored.